Okay, so in this episode, we're gonna cover the process of building this ridiculous home sim that I've been wanting ever since I was a kid, honestly. You know, we built it to a budget, but we put money where money needed to go. So um, starting with kind of like, I think the most important bit of the, of the rig is we did put in uh, an RTX 2080 Ti. So there she is in the spot where she'll live. Pretty nice. If we pull off what I think this setup is going to be like, yeah. this is like the fantasy that I've had as a kid, like having a sure. ridiculous, awesome setup in my house. So Pilot Edge is what made that airplane show up for me in the game, in the sim, right? We don't need to play game. <laughs> There'll be no gaming here. This is not gaming, although it is pretty fun. Boarding my third flight in two days. Fifth flight in four days. Fourth flight in five days. Seven. I got a zillion boxes that have been arriving over the past couple weeks. I've just yep. been piling them up. I haven't had time to even open them. Yep. We make what I think we're gonna make here. This is the dream. So it, it was enough to inspire me to tear apart my office. And <laughs> The last couple weeks have been a little challenging. Yeah, it was definitely a pretty aggressive time schedule, not gonna lie. Flight sim community is huge, and I'm trying to convince more real pilots to take a serious look at flight sims, so it's pretty cool to see what's going on with this community. Look at the size of the crowd in this room, this is bonkers. I'm getting a little bit used to doing these things, but I'm gonna admit, when I see a crowd this big, I'm gonna speak to it, I get nervous. Alright, there's Keith. We are miking up for the Flight Sim Expo talk. Pumped. So these are components for a over-the-top home sim. Sort of a uh, bit off a little more than I could chew here, but luckily I got a lot of help. And this is going to be pretty cool. So it's going to A, help me with flight test prep for the instrument rating. And B, help me with proficiency after I get the rating. <sighs> so let's build this thing. Okay, so you know, you start any PC gaming build or any PC build really with kind of like what is the mission profile for the system, right? And when somebody says I want a flight simulation rig, I kind of cringe because all flight simulators are just built kind of from a from a performance opt optimization perspective, they're just not that great. Very single threaded, meaning they don't util or they don't leverage the use of many CPU cores very well, um, and they're not very well optimized in general so you know we built it to a budget as you're aware but we put money where money needed to go so um starting with kind of like i think the most important bit of the, of the rig is we did put in uh, an rtx 2080 ti and we put in a really good uh, version of the rtx 2080 ti so that is a an asus rog strix oc edition they're really quiet and i know you said you wanted something that wasn't going to be a noisy card like this thing is currently crushing time spy and you really can't hear it it's going well. This is a very uh, intense benchmark. What I do is I recruit experts to help me with stuff. Absolutely. So you're my uh, sim guy expert, I guess. I don't know what to call you. Yeah. What, how do you describe what you do? Yeah, I mean, I uh, started as a little little side gig. Uh, really wanted to enhance my, uh, my flight training at home. Combination of avionics, combination of an actual panel setup. I started, uh, kind of on a journey, I don't know, a couple of years ago trying to do this and and realized that to do it, I kind of had to start building my own panel the way I wanted it configured, which was to be close to a replica of a, of a G1000, but obviously to be able to do it affordably with off-the-shelf components, that makes it simple to get going. All right, I'm just gonna include the viewers in this for a second, because this is real. Okay, so this is gonna be my first uh, radio check 
using Pilot Edge for real, talking to an actual controller sitting there at uh, North Bend Ground in Oregon. Right? That's where I am? Yep. Alright, North Bend Ground, this is Charlie Fox, Fox Kilo Oscar, looking for a radio check, please. Yes! Thank you. Oh, that is so cool, dude. You see how quick he responded? That was like real. Wow. Whether you're using Pilot Edge or Vatim or IVAO, any of those networks are actually great for learning radio communications. Um, different networks have different pros and cons, but generally speaking, if you're doing any kind of ATC interaction in your simulator, I, we, I think we agree that's a, that's a great place to be. Uh, the CPU in the system is an Intel 8700K. I'm sure people are gonna ask why I didn't put a 9700K in it. Um, that's gonna be the first question. Uh, mostly cost, but also um, overclocking overhead. So. We know flight simulators are not great at leveraging multiple cores. The 9700K is an 8-core processor. It does overclock fairly well, but it doesn't overclock quite as well as the 8700K. And uh, we have this particular 8700K delitted with liquid metal. Um, so basically the interface material between the top of the CPU and the actual die of the CPU. The 9700K is soldered old school. They went back to the solder, which is a great transfer mechanism. These CPUs for the last six or seven generations were using a really crappy thermal compound. So it didn't matter how awesome your cooling setup was, the die couldn't dissipate the heat into the, the, the spreader on top of the CPU. So we popped the lid off of that thing. You can intercut some pictures. Yeah, I, you gave I, me those pictures. I did give you those pictures. So that's got a liquid metal interface material in there. And our temperatures are awesome. We're cooling it with a 280 millimeter radiator block with two 140 millimeter fans. The CPU, if you, know, you want to get really nerdy, that's an Intel i7 8700K, D-leaded, liquid metal interface material, and it's running at a five gigahertz overclock on all cores. I like the idea of a thing that can help with both training and proficiency. Yes. It's not gonna exactly match what I'm gonna necessarily fly all the time, which is fine, because I'm jumping in and out of so many types anyway. Yep. And in fact, we're gonna configure this one to be a twin, yep. just cause why not make it more complex right. for what I do at home. The workmanship that you put into this, this is like, I see what you mean, like it really puts you in the, in the mode. You got a nice little made in USA there. It's pretty solid. I mean, that's, that feels like a panel. All things considered, so yeah, yeah this is gonna be perfect. So, the real sim gear, GNS 430. Yeah, that's awesome. So, all buttons, dials, push, all this. My issue is that I jumped in and out of so many types. I need to learn the Garmin 430 physical unit with the knobs and buttons, and I can't stand using a mouse for that stuff because in the real plane, as soon as you turn the knob the wrong way, when you gotta quickly dial in it, you're instantly flustered. So that to me is what I got the sim for, was the buttonology, I want the physicality of it. I want to match up what I'm gonna do my instrument flight test in. I guess it should be swapping 1200, eh? Yes. Okay, you are ready to call ground, my friend. Scared. Should be. <laughs> yeah, so the only flaw. Uh, we're gonna need a few minutes here to sort out some radio problems. We're gonna pull over to the uh, here and, uh, I'm gonna start right. to the other. I love how real this is. Yeah, just that is freaking real. So I should try to call him now. We got a chance. Yeah. And yeah. North Bend Ground. It's Charlie Foxtrot Foxtrot Kilo Oscar. Radio check, please.ChargingStation.ChargingStation.ChargingStation.ChargingStation.ChargingStation.ChargingStation.ChargingStation.ChargingStation.ChargingStation.ChargingStation.ChargingStation.ChargingStation.ChargingStation.ChargingStation.
I started filming the iPad, and then I taxied into the grass. <laughs> and, and, and the airplane actually got stuck. I'm like, oh no, this is friggin' awesome. Oh, I got one on the grass because I wasn't paying attention. I think I just broke my airplane. <laughs> Please tell me that's not true. I was trying to film my iPad on the uh, chair and I just went on the grass and now it's stuck. And at that moment, what you said kicked in. I'm like, oh, I would not have done this in a real plane, like film my iPad and taxi into the grass. So at that moment, I started thinking of it as a plane and that only took minutes. And then we did a departure and we did some formation flying and it felt very real in my office. It's a pretty good airflow design in here. I may add another 120 back here, um, but it, so far it's been fine. So it's drawing air from the front and there's, it looks, you know, like it's choked out, but there's a huge amount of, uh, yeah. of space here. And there's a filter here too. So it's filter there. It's drawing, um, the power supply is drawing from the bottom and exhausting out. So this is not actually contributing any heat or cooling effect to the computer. So basically it's all air in through the front out through the top and a little bit out through the back via the graphics card, but mostly the CPU is pushing all the air out from the top and I, I removed the filter from the top. Since you don't want to filter outbound air, it's going to restrict airflow. Now what's our score? It's finished over here. 13K, um, that's, that's pretty awesome, honestly. Uh, it's not running the 4K version of that benchmark right now. That's another thing is, I guess it's really important to note, some flight sim guys would say a 2080 Ti is overkill, except you're building this for VR. Right, and yeah, we're talking. I have the option. Yeah, next generation VR, especially too, because we're talking, you know, the new Oculus or the Vive Pro. You need frames per second to make that experience enjoyable. And while a 2080 Ti is not necessary for flight simming on a couple 1080p monitors, it is going to be necessary uh, for what you want to do to get that really immersive experience where you're getting 80, 90 frames a second in each eye at high resolution. You need this graphics card to drive that kind of load. Could we have done it with a 2080 or a 2070? We probably could have done it, but it wouldn't be as sweet. Plus it wouldn't look as cool, you know, right? In, P in PC gaming, it's like they want to, you want to show off the hardware. I know you had like no interest in that, but how sweet does that look? Yeah, it's pretty cool. So this is currently the fastest thing I've built and I'm happy with it, so. Awesome. A lot of buildings being drawn out here, and I'll be honest, pretty smooth in these shadows. No way. We got the anti-aliasing maxed. I mean, I think it's maxed, isn't it? Let me see. This is, this is, yeah. Wow. This is pretty impressive. I'm not gonna lie. When this all started, when we just made the decision to pull the trigger from going, I was gonna have a super low profile, teeny tiny little sim. Yep. Almost like a phoned in setup, honestly, in the amount of space that I had. So when we decided to do this, I texted Chris like, you son of a dot, dot, dot. Like I texted that literally, because this is kind of his fault, because I saw what you guys did and then we got to talking and it inspired me. It's like, all right, I'm gonna go all in with the home sim. Why not? And we went all in. I think this is a decent balance. Um, there are obviously more things, higher end things, more premium things that you could add. The example of getting a $200 yoke versus a $1,000 yoke. The goal with the panel is it's really that integration module, that integration piece where everything uh, comes together and ties together. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna throw the 430 unit display right on here. Basically pop this guy out down here. So you popped it out. Yeah. We're gonna push this button right here. It's now gonna be called a window, but you see it's got this white bar. Yeah. We don't want that white bar to show up on the actual unit. Oh, so you're dragging it in. Wait, so show me that. So you're dragging yeah. it off the so, screen. So you're dragging it off the screen. Yeah. And then you're starting to drag it over here. Yeah. And now you can maximize it. And voila. What just happened? And that was really cool. Like to be dialing in the frequencies and playing with actual physical buttons. So I can see how, for me, as a, using it as a procedural trainer, immersing myself into my workflow, like put your kneeboard where it goes, write your clearances down on a pencil, do it all in real time, don't taxi into the grass because you're filming your lap. Yeah. Uh, I can see my, and I don't think that I would have treated it like a real plane if we didn't have Pilot Edge hooked up with a controller waiting for me, knowing that if I sit here taking forever, the guy who just gave me clearance to get to the whole short line is gonna be like, where are you? If you didn't have an ATC system, you would have started on the runway with the engine running. You would have hit the gas, you would have done a high performance takeoff, turned around and started doing loops and rolls over the airport. That's what most people would do in a sim. Probably, um, yeah. The whole idea of having to look at an airport diagram and process a taxi instruction, um, that has tremendous training value. If you can expose yourself to 100 different towered airports, 
during your training, then when you go to fly at the 101st towered airport on a long distance cross country, it's no big deal. So, I mean, that's a great way to be learning for a flight on the ground safely, okay, in the comfort of your own home versus trying to learn for a flight while you're flying. Yeah. Okay, so just a little safety uh, tip out there. So here we are, we're coming in to uh, six. I'm uh, gonna get into talking a little bit about Real Sim Gear as well. So Jared over at Real Sim Gear is an awesome partner into this whole piece as well. That was part of the inspiration. Yeah, too, absolutely. I'm yep. working with the Garmin 430 in the airplane that I'm gonna tr finish my training in, do my instrument flight test in. So that, although the idea that I can have a unit that actually matches the buttonology is amazing because that's something yeah. I always trip over. It's like, oh, I pressed it. Now my cursor's uh, uh, twist. No, the big one. So just those simple things like that. If I can do that a dozen times at home, by the time I get to the flight test, it's one less thing to trip over. This yeah. is all fantastic. So if we paused actually and actually went with uh, what were we? Y Y Z. Yeah. So let's just go like Y Y Z here for a second. And we're fine. And. Uh, Okay, so now, I mean, we're, I mean, obviously we're here, right? But it's, now it's going to start giving me some distance and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, to the whole thing, and and here we are. We're setting up. We're full flap. Right. right. So it's telling me I'm on. I mean, this is this is really cool. I think it's all cool. I'm even working with uh, Infinite Flight, dealing with their you know mobile app. Sure. Now, yeah. of course, that's limited, right? You, yep. You, there's the compromise is based on the interface, but it's portable, man. Like I can't. I'm traveling a lot. The idea that I can pull it out real quick, just just play around, do some procedures or something like that, just get my head in the game, mobile. That's got a place too. Yep. So I want to tell like the whole spectrum of stories with simulators and. Uh, applying it to my real world flying. So I think I think it's gonna be a fun side mission to tell this type of story. Absolutely. I do feel like it's a thing that has been missing in my world for a long time. From where I'm sitting in the right seat, somebody watching people spend thousands and thousands of dollars in real fl flight training, there's tremendous value to what Keith just said. Getting a taxi clearance, looking at a taxi diagram and processing the route is arguably more important than being able to hold the taxi center line on the simulator.